Greetings, I'm Grin Grimsley and you're watching the exciting first episode of a brand new season of Grin Reviews. If you're wondering why everything looks a little bit dark right now, it's because today we're having a look at Night Driver for the Atari 2600. When I first started playing Night Driver for the Atari 2600, admittedly my first thoughts were what the heck is wrong with these game's controls? No matter how I jiggled my pleasure stick, it seemed that the car would just run into the side and explode. But then I took a slightly closer look at the cartridge art, and then I noticed that above the rather cool looking picture it tells you to use with paddle controllers. Considering that it's currently not working too well with the pleasure stick, I can only assume that the pleasure stick is not a paddle controller. So I sent a rather strongly worded message to management asking them what the deal was having me review a game without providing me with the proper equipment. And in the standard style of a bureaucratically ran business we received our answer in 3 short months. And this is basically where this review becomes 2 reviews because this is the Atari 2600 panel controller. Or perhaps as I should say, this is the Atari 2600 Paddle Controllers, because they, just like delicious fun-sized Cadbury chocolates coming in a favorites box, come in pairs. As you can see, the two controllers, despite initially having their own cords, can join at the end, merging into one single plug. I'm rather a big fan of how economical this is, but I'm not a big fan of how unorganized this is. Neither of the two controllers say whether they are controller 1 or controller 2, so by the time they've wrapped around the back of your console and come back towards you, it's not difficult to pick up the wrong controller. And by not difficult, I mean as a rule, I have always picked up the wrong controller first. At first I was wondering why this controller was in fact called a paddle controller. I mean when you look at the pleasure stick it's rather obvious why it's called a pleasure stick because the pleasure stick itself is front and center. But the paddle controller's most notable feature is a dial. I then noticed at the bottom of the controllers there was a picture of cross tennis rackets. And at this point I thought I had cracked the case wide open and this may be the reason they're called paddle controllers. But as any sportswear equipment enthusiast would tell you, paddles and rackets are simply not the same thing. So I'm still at a loss to explain the title. And then on the top left hand side of the controllers is a red button, which I assume performs a relatively similar function to the red button on the pleasure stick. So now that we've familiarized ourselves with the paddle controller, let's have another look at Night Driver. And as you can probably tell straight up the bat, or rather straight up the paddle, that's a sportswear equipment enthusiast joke for all of you sportswear equipment enthusiasts out there, but as you can see straight off the paddle, the game controls a lot better now that I'm actually using the proper controls. Go figure. To make your vehicle move forward you hold down the red button, and to make your vehicle turn left or right you simply twist the dial in the direction you want it to move. The use of these controllers for this game actually felt really good and really intuitive, and overall I think it gave a more immersive feeling than simply using the pleasure stick for this game would have. However, on that positive note, the controls do still leave a little bit to be desired. If you had noticed, I mentioned that pushing the red button makes your vehicle move forward. And I said this specifically avoiding the word accelerate, because there's no real acceleration to this game. Your vehicle is either not moving or moving at its top speed and there really is no in between. This can be rather annoying if you've crashed and your vehicle is stuck on a curve and you just really need to accelerate only a tiny bit to try to wiggle your way out of it. But with the game only allowing you to go to full acceleration every time you hit the red button, you basically just have to crash a lot of time, slowly inching yourself around the corner until you finally break free. There's just simply no way you can make micro corrections in this game. Another issue stemming from these controls is the fact that the paddles can go full lock, which means that sometimes you find yourself needing to turn but being unable to do so because your controller has reached its turn limit. This can once again be really annoying if you find yourself stuck on the wall and are unable to turn away from it because you simply cannot turn your dial any further. However, admittedly, my dislike for this lock function actually lessened the more I played the game because it turns out you simply do not actually need to turn the dial much to turn your vehicle around a corner. So once you really start to get accustomed to how much you actually need to turn, you don't really get locked up quite so much. Moving on to the graphics in the game, they are kind of inconsistent. 
As you may have noticed, the graphics you're looking at on the screen at the moment are a little bit blurry and not exactly high definition. This, however, is not a reflection of the game, but simply because both our new and old capture card really disagree with this game and don't pick up much of an image at all. What this means is we've had to go old school, and what you're seeing is just the product of a camera being pointed at a TV screen. So I really do apologize for that graphical problem on our end. This aside, however, you can clearly see trees and houses on the side the road and you can sort of clearly see that the things coming towards you are other people's cars. But these people's cars are one of the things that weirds me out a fair bit about this game. They are fairly detailed despite the fact that you only see them quickly moving towards you and yet your vehicle which you stare at the entire game has pretty much no detail to it. I really think that these two graphics should have been swapped especially because your vehicle really doesn't look much like a car at all. In fact, it looks considerably more like you're looking at the back end of the vehicle you drive in Planet Patrol, which is not a good thing because that game was just awful. On either side of your vehicle, marking either side of the road, there are neon poles, which as I said, mark where the road is. These are rather simple graphically, but the 3D effect they managed to achieve impressed me a great deal. And also the fact that they are a neon color on a black background really helped add to the sense of speed. While I know I was nitpicking the graphics a little bit earlier, I would say that if I could only really complain and change one thing in the graphics, it would be the fact that there is no real turning animation. Because your car is always in the dead center at the bottom of the screen and it's the poles going past you that mark how much you're turning, it kind of sometimes feels like you're not turning at all, forcing you to overcorrect. Even if we were given only a very slight turning animation like the banking and river raid, it would have really helped the illusion on a lot further. All of this aside, however, Night Driver is still a fun, fast-paced, and very addictive game, and I definitely suggest you give it a shot. So if you're looking for something to do tonight, have yourself a nighttime drive down to the late night video store and pick up a copy of Night Driver for the Atari 2600. Welcome to a relaxful new episode of Grin Reviews. This episode is going to be a little bit more laid back than normal, so put up your feet, pour yourself a cool drink, and get ready to unwind as we take a look at Fishing Derby for the Atari 2600. Now it may not surprise many of you to learn that I'm not exactly the biggest fisherman. You see, two of my biggest loves are being indoors and electricity, and fish are more often than not found outdoors and in water, which is basically electricity's biggest nemesis. This said, the few times I have actually in fact found myself fishing, I did in truth thoroughly enjoy it. The relaxing nature of the sport exposes you to actual nature, which, naturally, gives you a break from the fast-paced nature of modern-day life. And yes, before you call me out on it, I'm well aware of the contradiction I just spoke. While the statement is rather paradoxic, I cannot help but claim that the best and worst thing about fishing is being outside and a complete lack of technology. So of course the concept of fishing inside through the use of technology immediately intrigued me as it both removes the best and worst elements of fishing. As you can see on the screen right now, the game in question, Fishing Derby, places you on a pier across from a pier who is also sitting on a pier. The game is made by the company Activision, which is the same company that brought us River Raid, so I was not surprised to find and pretty much half expected the graphics to be absolutely gorgeous. As you can see in the water, there are six fish that are swimming around and a shark, who too is also swimming around. The object of the game is to catch more fish than your opponent who is also trying to catch fish. You do this as you might well expect by utilizing your fishing rod because unfortunately in this game there are no spear guns, which probably would have been pretty darn cool added to the excitement of the game and made short work of the shark. And before any animal activists get angry at me, please remember that I'm talking about killing an electronic shark with an electronic spear gun electronically. No animals were harmed in the making of this sentence. The deeper the depths the fish come from, the longer and more difficult it is to get them, and as you might well expect because of this, the more points they pay out. You might imagine that this is sort of a risk and reward thing going on, and I, I think that was the intention, but unfortunately, while it does add a lot of reward, it doesn't really add much risk, and because of how easy it is to get the fish from the bottom, you might as well just always get the fish from the bottom, and if you do so, you're pretty much always going to win the game regardless of what difficulty setting you're on. 
They could have perhaps improved the risk part of the risk and reward system of this game rather fantastically if they had just added a second shark that randomly swims across the midsection of the screen making it actually a little bit more risky to go for the bottom fish. But with that not included there's not really any tension in the game at all. Despite this, as I mentioned, the title of the game is in fact Fishing Derby, and your peer across from the pier is also competing against you, and the first person to get to 99 points wins the game. And I think this is one of the many issues with this game. You see, the pacing and gameplay of the game actually stands in stark contradiction to the title of the game and the actual goal of the game. The gameplay is itself slow paced with no risk and very little control over the actual controls. Sure you actually control the hook and the fishing line but half the time the fish appear to have a mind of their own and sometimes you're just sitting there like an idiot as the fish doesn't want to take the bait. And then even when the fish does take the bait half the time it's very difficult to reel it in with the control seeming unresponsive. Despite all this, there is a point system and you're sitting directly across from your opponent who you're supposedly supposed to be trying to beat. Despite this however, it never feels like if you try harder you'll do better. It's sort of like if you had to race someone but both of you had to walk slowly, wear only one shoe and be completely blindfolded. The competition's there but neither of you are really competing. On the other hand though, the knowledge that the competition is there and that you are in fact supposed to be competing makes it so that you cannot completely relax while playing this game. As such, rather unfortunately, this game both fails in the fishing department and the derby department because the derby department aka the competition of this game is executed so poorly that it doesn't really feel like you can properly compete. But the knowledge you're supposed to be competing ruins the fishing part of the game because you cannot relax which is my favorite thing to do while fishing. As such because this game so spectacularly fails to simulate fishing and competition I can unfortunately not encourage you to play it. I suppose if you really do have your heart set on a fishing simulator you can set the game to two player and sort of just casually fish while the other player doesn't do anything. But if you have your heart set on a fishing derby as this game advertises, it's unfortunately going to let you down. So with all of this said and done, if you are looking for a fun game made by Activision to play this evening set above water, head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of River Raid for the Atari 2600. It's sort of like fishing derby, they both have water. Welcome back to Grid Reviews. The game we're having a look at today is a non-stop force of action, which perhaps should surprise no one because it's action force for the Atari 2600. Now as far as I understand it, action force is somehow connected to Action Man, which in extension is apparently also connected to G.I. Joe. I'm not really to be completely honest certain how all of these things tie together. Grim did try to explain it to me but I got bored and tuned out. You see, growing up I got most of my cartoon action fix from He-Man and Pole Position which really just left no room for G.I. Joe. So I'm not saying I didn't like it, I just never really gave it a chance and as such I don't exactly have much of a working knowledge of the show. If you were to ask me to name some characters, I would probably struggle and just hope that one was called Action Man, one was called G.I. Joe and their team was called Action Force. But really I'm just grasping at straws there. Luckily however this is one of the rare occasions where management has actually provided me with the manual. Which means I'm not going to have to rely on my very spotty knowledge of Action Man, G.I. Joe and Action Force to actually know what's happening in the game. So what in fact does the manual actually tell us? Well rather simply it tells us defend and fire. That's our mission in this battle between Action Force and our enemy, an evil organization determined to take over the world. So it appears to be your average bad guys are trying to do bad things because they're bad sort of deal going on here. In the style that's not exactly uncommon for the Atari 2600 and indeed can be seen in many other games such as Joust, Missile Command and Millipede, this is not where the story ends and it actually has an entire 3 paragraphs telling us what's going on. I am however not going to bother reading the entire thing here verbatim because, you know, it's not exactly necessary, but I'll quickly sum up the important bits. You yourself through the use of a paddle controller control the atomic powered energy shield you see moving along the bottom of the screen here. The object of the game is twofold, firstly you have to protect the action force recruits running across the bottom of the screen there. 
You do so by maneuvering the atomic powered energy shield through the use of your paddle controller between said recruits and the gigantic robotic cobra sent down by Baron Ironblood in time to block any venom or laser blast sent down by the monstrous mechanical menace. If you fail to protect a recruit and he's vaporized, you lose a life. And if you lose four lives, the game is over. Now, you may have noticed I said if you fail to protect a recruit and he's vaporized, you lose a life, not if you fail to stop a blast sent down by the Cobra. And this is actually one of the very interesting game mechanics that make Action Force so very fun. You see, not unlike in Missile Command, where you don't have to defend an already destroyed city, in Action Force, if you see Venom or a laser blast that you judge is not going to hit a recruit, you don't really have to bother blocking it. The reason that this is worth noting is because, as the manual mentioned, the game has two requirements, defend and fire, which means that if you're only bothering to stop the enemy's bullets when it's absolutely necessary, you can turn your attention to concentrating on the other game's objective, namely fire. And indeed, you should certainly do so, because while you do get points for your recruitments getting over to the other side and reaching safety, you do not actually get any points for blocking the enemy's shots. However, what you do get points for in addition to your recruits making the distance is by landing shots on the enemy and killing Cobras. And if you're wondering, you did hear me correctly, I did indeed say Cobras in plural, but let's not get ahead of ourselves and first talk about firing. In order to take the fight to the Cobra itself, you must pilot your atomic powered force shield to one of the gun emplacements on either the left or right of the screen. Once there, hold down the red button on your paddle controller which will fire a shot, and if you continue to hold down that red button, the shot will continue and your atomic powered force shield will remain locked in place at the gun emplacement. You see, this is yet another one of the interesting mechanics that make Action Force such an enjoyable game. As while well locked in the gunner position, your paddle controller will no longer maneuver your atomic energy shield, but instead the shots you fired. And as I indicated earlier in this video, you can use those shots to take down the Cobras. It takes 8 hits to kill a Cobra, and while it's a little bit difficult to make your shots hit their mark, I find the best way to do it is to have them lance across the face of the Cobra. Cobras, not unlike many of these species on this planet, do not enjoy being shot in the face with a giant cannon. Once you land your 8th shot on the Cobra, it will be torn in two as if the very fabric of its being is ripped away from our perspective of reality, only to be replaced seconds later by a faster moving, quicker firing Cobra of different color. However, all is not completely dire as we're awarded with a little bit of a ditty and some bonus points. There is no end to the replacement of Cobras and eventually you will be worn down and defeated. This means that the game teaches us all an important lesson about the eventual inevitability of death and that we might as well just have fun and try to get a high score in the time that we have. So with that, the basic outline of the game summed up, let's briefly talk about the controls. The controls in Action Force are extremely well done. To begin with, I wasn't a huge fan of how the atomic powered shield control, it felt a little bit too fast and a little bit too sensitive. However, as I played the game, got used to the controls and actually learned the controls, I warmed up to them greatly. The main thing that really changed my opinion on the controls was finding out that clicking the red button on your paddle controller would lock your position. This made a significant difference in the gameplay because it meant rather than getting quickly to a position and then holding it still with the very sensitive controls, you could instead just move it across the screen and once it got to the point you needed to stop at, you could lock it dead. And being able to do so made the sensitivity make a lot more sense, so really I have to give a pretty big thumbs up for the controls in Action Force. And we might as well keep that thumb proudly standing upright as we talk about the graphics in the game, because as you can probably tell from the screen, they are absolutely beautiful. The Cobra is very clearly a Cobra, its death scenes are rather violent, the lasers it shoots are rather awesome, and the Action Force recruits are clearly little green army men. It is easily one of the best looking games I've played on the Atari 2600, and with its impressive animations and vibrant colors, it's an utter pleasure to look at as you play the game. So, there you have it, Action Force for the Atari 2600. Good controls, great gameplay, and beautiful graphics, and no one would probably think you were the fool to assume that this is where the review would end. However, while this would already have been enough to make Action Force a fantastically worthwhile game to play on the Atari 2600, it somehow offers even more. I am of course talking about the multiplayer options within Action Force, which go above and beyond any multiplayer options I've seen in any Atari 2600 game so far. 
Whereas most games really cheap out in the multiplayer option and make you just take turns trying to get a high score, in Action Force a second player instead has the option to pick up the second paddle controller and take control of a second atomic powered energy shield. This means that you and the second player can work together defending the soldiers and taking shots at the enemy, with one of you manning the cannon and one of you blocking shots or just both of you doing the best you can to do both, the game is a fantastic multiplayer game to team up with a friend and try to defeat evil. But wait there's more! What if you and your friend are actually really competitive against each other? Well, by plugging a pleasure stick into the second controller port, now one of you can control the Cobra itself with the pleasure stick, while the other player with the paddle controller will continue to control the atomic powered energy shield. And if that staggering diversity is still not enough for you, and you have one more friend who still is looking for something to do, by picking up the second paddle controller and switching up another game variant, you now have the two players on the paddle controllers controlling two atomic powered energy shields versing a third player on the pleasure stick controlling the Cobra. That's right ladies and gentlemen, Action Force for the Atari 2600 is not only a beautiful looking game with solid controls and fantastic gameplay that would have already been enough to make it one of my favorite games I've played so far, it also has the ability to play 2 and 3 player games. And so I cannot stress enough that if you're looking for a fun game to play this weekend by yourself, with a friend, or even with two friends, then head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Action Force for the Atari 2600. I love it how the last line in the manual when you actually think about it kind of insults you. It reads, it's a mission for only highly trained commandos like Action Force. And you. If you were to say the words Jedi Arena to most Star Wars fans, it would likely invoke memories of the end of Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. This is in no small part due to the fact that at the end of Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones, there is in fact an arena and it is indeed full of Jedi. However, unlike the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle, the previous two Star Wars games I played for the Atari 2600, Jedi Arena does not appear to be based on any particular battle within the Star Wars franchise. In fact, unlike Empire Strikes Back and the Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle which were both fairly clear in what they were graphically representing, while first playing Jedi Arena I really had no idea what I was looking at or what I was supposed to be doing, and so not unlike a man who's been stuck trying to assemble an Ikea flat pack for the last 3 weeks must admit his defeat and turn to the instructions, I too was forced to redirect my attention to the game's manual. And indeed having a look at the cover art of the cartridge game box and manual immediately starts to give you a clear idea of what's going on. Firstly it appears that the spherical object that floats around between the two players is a training remote like the one from Star Wars Episode 4 A New Hope and from Star Wars Episode 7 The Force Awakens. In retrospect this should probably have been immediately obvious because I can't imagine any other spherical objects in the Star Wars universe known to shoot lasers. Looking at it again in the game, they definitely managed to nail the remote's movement and I love the way that it just sort of shoots around the screen, although I'm not entirely sure why they got the color and the shape wrong. Also it's kind of strange that instead of shooting laser bolts like it does in the movie, it instead appears to shoot lightning. I can however quite happily forgive this slight inaccuracy, both because the lightning effect within the game looks absolutely fantastic, and also because using your little guy on the bottom of the screen to block the lightning with your lightsaber makes me feel like I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi once again in Attack of the Clones. But I've gotten a little bit off topic, what exactly is it that the manual tells us? Well it begins with the opening paragraph that says, will you accept the challenge to become the Jedi Master? Yes I will, find out if you. A Jedi Knight are worthy of such a title, I most certainly am. Meet your opponent in the Jedi Arena where you're face to face in an electrifying laser battle. Well actually I think you will find it is in fact lightning but let's move on. Use quick reflexes and swift lightsaber to score once, twice, three times. When you do, you are the Jedi Master. 
So essentially what they're saying is to win this game. You must have Jedi reflexes. Well, that is the objective, but it doesn't exactly instruct you in any real degree on what you actually have to do to play this game. And I really wouldn't blame you if you're watching the screen right now and wondering what the heck is going on. So this is probably a good point to explain the controls. Well, firstly, not unlike Action Force on the Atari 2600, the game can kind of be boiled down to defend and fire. And indeed, to either defend or fire, you're going to have to use the dial on your paddle controller. You see, moving the dial left will move the lightsaber of your little guy left. And of course, moving the dial right will move the lightsaber of your little guy right. You must utilize these controls to move your lightsaber to block any incoming lightning blast, which, if you miss, will hit your force shield down the bottom there, which will then take damage. In a somewhat similar fashion to the Death Star in Star Wars Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle, the force field will actually take real damage and chunks of it will be removed each time it's hit. If the force field is hit too many times, it opens up, well, your character I suppose to being hit properly, although it's sort of more like a goalpost. And if that area is left unguarded and the lightning spitting training remote manages to land a good shot, then your opponent is awarded a point. So really when it comes to the defensive side of the game, the real objective is to protect your goalpost from any lightning and helping you do so is two points of defense. Firstly, there's the force build, which is kind of like a goalie. And then secondly, there's your actual lightsaber, which is kind of like a guy standing 10 meters in front of your goalie with a lightsaber, cutting down anyone who comes to try to score a goal. And so that's the defensive side of the game explained, so let's get on to the offensive side where it gets a little bit more tricky and a little bit more complicated. You see, because the Atari 2600 paddle controller only has one dial on it, and so therefore to attack you're using the exact same dial that you're using to defend. When you press the red button on your paddle controller, the training remote sends a bolt of lightning towards your enemy in whatever direction you've got the dial pointing. Although often that means to aim at your enemy, and especially if you're trying to bore your way through part of the enemy's shield, you're going to have to turn your lightsaber away, opening up your defenses in order to launch an attack. And so therefore, since you don't actually control the movement of the training remote yourself, and because both you and your opponent share it to launch attacks, and especially because it's the same dial controlling your defensive and offensive capabilities, this game really does become an adrenaline-filled cat and mouse game, especially when you're playing it on the harder setting. When I first started playing this game, I thought that the shared controls for the defensive lightsaber and the offensive lightning bolts were sort of weird and I wasn't really that into it. Although now that I've played the game a fair bit and got used to it, I think it's probably actually the main highlight of the game. It leads to a lot of careful tactics and planning, is something I've not seen in any game before and really sets this game apart from any other that I've played. Oh, so as you're playing the game, a sort of white noise builds up in the background and when it gets to a very loud, almost storm-like rumble, it releases lightning in all crazy directions. This is quite hard to defend against and if you have got holes in your force field, it can be pretty darn deadly. And so really that's the important part of the game review just now. The actual gameplay part of it and the controls are both really well done and extremely enjoyable. And for that alone I can definitely recommend this game. However that said it does have some negatives that I will get into now. Well first and foremost my main and I guess only complaint is really the graphics. The graphics are not good. They're not terrible but they're definitely not Star Wars. As I belly ached about earlier, they didn't even try to make the training remote look like a training remote, and that would have been a really easy thing to do. If you once again consider the other two Star Wars games, Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle and The Empire Strikes Back, they really put in a lot of care and love to make it resemble the scenes in the movie. However, if you're looking at the screen right now, there's really nothing in the game aside from a red stick and a blue stick that really screams Star Wars. And even in their case, your characters don't look like guys holding lightsabers, but kind of just someone wiggling a stick. When I was told that the game I would be reviewing this Star Wars month on the Atari 2600 would be called Jedi Arena, my initial thoughts were how are they possibly going to do lightsaber combat on the Atari? And I guess the answer is that they really didn't know. It definitely feels like this game was turned into Star Wars as a bit of an afterthought. In fact, if you turn the game on its side, it starts to look like an entirely different encounter. And actually, come to think of it, in the manual, it mistakenly refers to the training remote as a seeker, which sounds suspiciously like Quidditch terminology to me. Although I guess that lightning was never a factor in Quidditch. Oh, wait. And so with all of this taken into account, I guess while the game's not a very good Star Wars game, it's definitely a very good Harry Potter game. 
And so if you're looking for a fun Harry Potter game to play this Star Wars month, then head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire Graveyard Dark Lord Encounter for the Atari 2600. I can't believe a game that combined Star Wars and Harry Potter had absolutely no John Williams in it. What a bummer. It's Christmas Eve and Santa can't find a reindeer. Oh no. How will he deliver the toys to all the boys and girls? Where oh where could they be? That's the premise of the game we're having a look at today, Reindeer Rescue for the Atari 2600. As you might well imagine from the blurb I just read from the manual, the game sees you playing as the big man in red himself as he attempts to rescue reindeer. There are two reindeer to collect each level, and as tradition dictates, Santa's sleigh is pulled by eight reindeer, which means we can utilize the power of mathematics to work out that this game has in total four levels, a fact that is confirmed to us in the manual. But these statistics may well leave you wondering, but what about the most famous reindeer of all? Where does Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer factor into this game? And the answer is, rather disappointingly, that as far as I can tell, he simply doesn't. At first I assumed that the game was set in the distant past, during a time in Rudolph's life in which all the other reindeer still laughed and called him names. Although if we take closer look at the evidence, which of course we should, Robert Louis May's historical account of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer becoming part of Santa's sled team came out in the form of a peer-reviewed essay in 1939. Why this is important is because a close reading of the manual mentions that Santa is not the athlete he used to be, and then refers to a state championship in 400 meter sprint which took place in 1943. Which means that since this game is definitely set after 1943, and since 1943 comes after 1939, it raises the question, where is Rudolph? However, where Rudolph is becomes quite clear if you have a quick look at the background of level 1, which reveals a shiny sun and bright blue sky. And since everyone knows that Rudolph has no obligation to work Christmas Day if it is not foggy or smoggy, it makes sense that he's not in this game. It's in his contract. And now that we've covered the curious absence of Rudolph from this game, which I know you were all concerned about, let's get to talking a little bit more specifically about the game itself. And first on the agenda is the controls, which are relatively simple. You, playing as Santa Claus, can make the jolly man jump by clicking the red button and make him move by jiggling your pleasure stick, which might sound relatively similar to yet another game that we've reviewed on this channel in which you also play as a red character who jumps with the red button, moves with the pleasure stick, and makes his way through levels. Yes, it seems that I cannot go through one Christmas video without referring back to Donkey Kong, because if memory serves correctly, I brought it up when talking about Stay Frosty 2 also. When bringing up the similarities between Stay Frosty 2 and Donkey Kong last year, it was almost entirely due to the controls and gameplay. However, when comparing it to Reindeer Rescue, there is one extra thing that cannot be overlooked, which is of course the graphics. The similarities between the two characters should simply not be ignored. They are of course, as I've stated, both wearing red suits, which I feel is enough to establish that they are in fact the same character. That's right ladies and gentlemen, it seems that Donkey Kong, in which you play as a young Santa Claus before his beards come in, is a prequel to Reindeer Rescue. Which makes a lot of sense and kind of explains why the bad guy is a gingerbread man who throws cookies at you. Although we're not here today to talk about Donkey Kong as we've already done that previously. And so back onto Reindeer Rescue where the controls of the game are actually considerably tighter than that of Donkey Kong giving you a lot more control over the character. You see in Donkey Kong if you want your little Santa Claus to jump you simply click the red button and who jump upwards, press left on your pleasure stick and click the red button and who jump up and left and press right on your pleasure stick while clicking the red button and who jump up and right. Each of these three jumps will propel your character character the same distance every time you do it, as the height and distance of the jump is predetermined from the point of initiation. 
However, in Reindeer Rescue, this is very much not the case, and you can change the direction Santa Claus is moving at any point of the game, regardless of whether or not his feet are on the ground. You could be mid-leap, moving at high speeds, and realize that you're about to run out of space to land on what you're trying to land on, and immediately correct this by pushing left on your pleasure stick, dropping Santa's speed rapidly. However, he cannot jump left, not because he's related to Derek Zoolander or anything, but because it's simply how the gameplay of the game is designed. You see, unlike Donkey Kong, the level in Reindeer Rescue is not static, but always moving left. Or I suppose, more accurately, Santa Claus is always moving right, and the camera is tracking him. It's like one of those cool continuous one-shot takes you see in those artsy movies. You know, like in Dismembering Christmas or something. This, like most things in life, both have its positives and negatives. In the realm of positives, it's far more interesting to look at than a static screen would be. You're always wanting to know what comes next, and while the map's not randomized, there's certainly plenty to see. There are branching paths to pay attention to, the reindeer that when you collect two of them, it'll take you to the next level, and items that give you points and extend your energy bar. The energy bar is an interesting aspect to this game, which I think could have probably been taken further. It works a lot like the melt and stay frosty in which you have to pick up items to maintain staying alive however unfortunately i never found myself really at a risk of running out of energy i think it would have been far more interesting in the game if the energy drained quicker and there were more items to collect to extend it as i mentioned earlier visually the game is fantastic to look at and this is really sold by just how the background and foreground of the game looks while everything in the foreground is moving one way everything in the background is moving the opposite way really selling the idea that you're moving quite far across the terrain and on top of that it's all quite christmasy if not so much for the foreground then definitely the background as we see many christmasy and north pole icons moving past including but not limited to a polar bear a train which i assume is the Polar Express, a snowman which is almost certainly Frosty making a cameo appearance, a sled being pulled, and an ATAT being chased by a snow speeder? I mean, surely not, but it looks exactly the same as it does in Star Wars Empire Strikes Back for the Atari 2600. Oh, wait! A snow speeder just flew across the foreground, and it looks exactly as it does in the film, not just the game. This game, Star Wars Snow Speeder, actually looks better than the Snow Speeder in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back for the Atari 2600. Look at that, it's a thing of total beauty, which I suppose means Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back is confirmed as a Christmas movie, Hoth is actually a place found in the North Pole, and even more exciting and somewhat hilarious, it means that while you're doing the epic battle in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back on the Atari 2600, just below you, only just out of sight, is Santa Claus frantically trying to find his reindeer. Now that's funny. But I digress, and to get back on topic, somehow we're going to follow that piece of awesomeness with the negative, which I assure you is not hugely negative, so don't worry too much, it doesn't take away from how amazing that Star Wars cameo is. Although, unfortunately, it does mean that this game is following the somewhat disappointing tradition of Stay Frosty 2, in which it is a game that I'm reviewing that I have actually not quite finished. You see, usually when I'm doing one of these reviews, if the game has an ending, I don't do the review until I have reached it. Which is totally not why Grin Reviews update so sporadically, shut up. But unfortunately, since Christmas is time sensitive, I don't really have time to keep trying to pass the game because Christmas is tomorrow and I have already sunk so many weeks into trying to beat the third level. And so the downside to the always scrolling level, which is not really so much of a downside because it's just how the game is, and if you don't like it, find a different game I suppose, but the only slight negative is that since you can't really move left because of how quickly everything's moving right, if you misjudge a jump, there's no way to correct it because you're going to be pushed against whatever's coming at you from the right, and there's plenty of obstacles that are too tall for you to jump over. Essentially, this means that if your timing is not absolutely perfect, you're going to find yourself trapped behind a house or a light pole or something, and slowly and unavoidably be pushed into the left-hand side of the screen, which will take one of your lives away. Now, this in itself is definitely not a negative. It is the basic core gameplay of the game, and I think it's actually quite good. It's fast-paced, and in the third level, and I can only assume the fourth level, it really gets the adrenaline and pumping. However, it does have a negative somewhat connected to it, which I think could have definitely been avoided. You see, the game has a lot of trial and error, whether it be in the third level, having to know what's coming up next basically before jumping on the right-hand side of the screen, or having to know which of the branching paths are better to take in the second 
second level. Now, this would still be fine. I have no problem with trial and error, but the only real issue I take, and it's kind of a large one, is that the third level is so much more difficult than the first and the second, and there's no option to continue, and you only get three lives. This means that basically, you're going to almost immediately know how to pass the first two levels, and all you're wanting to do is try to have a go at the third level, which is far more fun to play and far more interesting compared to the first and second level, which, after doing a couple of times, are going to become really boring. It takes 3 minutes and 15 seconds to pass the first and the second level, which I think by now I can pretty much do blindfolded, and I cannot count how many times I had to do them, only to spend 30 seconds on the third level, losing all of my lives on a blind jump that has to be made on a dime. I really don't want to know how many times I missed these jumps, and this is not all of them, but bear in mind, every three times you see me dying in this compilation means another three minutes and 15 seconds going through the first two levels, which at this point I've committed to memory. And so I suppose the only downside to this entire game is that it desperately needs a continue option, because if you've already mastered the first two levels and just want to practice on the third one, you're going to be extremely frustrated and somewhat bored being forced to play the first two levels again, and again, and again. This aside, however, Reindeer Rescue is still definitely worth the play. It's a beautiful game with great graphics, tight control, interesting level design and gameplay, and gives you plenty of Christmas cheer. And also, it should be noted that the art on the manual and cartridge is extremely charming. So if you're looking for a frustrating but festive game to play this holiday season, then head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Reindeer Rescue for the Atari 2600. Hello and welcome to Grin Reviews. Well, I feel that during all reviewers' careers, they eventually, inevitably reach a point in which they must display their skills as a ninja. And for me at least, I feel that I finally reached that point, as I take a look at Wall Jump Ninja for the Atari 2600. If years of watching the Ninja Turtles have taught me anything, it's that ninjas are, despite having rather heavy and cumbersome shells, rather agile. They love pizza, and they're exceptionally good at jumping on walls. And that's why when management told me that the next game I would be reviewing on Grin Reviews was ninja related, I was not surprised to find that it was related to one of these three ninja categories. And while the game is unfortunately not Compass and Shell Agility Simulator, nor is it Pizza Eating Simulator, it is, however, Wall Jump Ninja for the Atari 2600, a game in which you play as a ninja who jumps on walls. Now, on the offset, I feel I have to mention that control-wise, Wall Jump Ninja is almost certainly the most simplistic game I've played on the Atari 2600. Which is definitely saying something, because almost every single game I've played on the Atari 2600 uses a controller which has one button and one pleasure stick, with the games being controlled by a combination of both, excluding the ones that use the paddle controller, which just swap out the pleasure stick for a simple dial. So, considering that most games have only two inputs, the fact that I'm saying Wall Jump Ninja is simplistic should definitely say something to you. And if it doesn't, I'll say it far more plainly. The only thing you need to play Wall Jump Ninja is the red button. Now, this is not a negative. In fact, it's the polar opposite. You see, where some games try to do perhaps a little bit too much with the limited controls they're given, instead Wall Jump Ninja limited their controls even further and instead opted for a level of polish I've not seen in any other game so far. In Wall Jump Ninja, you simply press the red button to jump and hold the red button to jump higher. And while that might sound too simple to be fun, it's definitely not. This is easily one of the most addictive games I've played so far. The game is fast paced and quite easy to lose, and since the only goal of the game is to get through as many rooms as possible, when you do eventually lose, you're going to find yourself immediately hitting the reset button to try to get a higher score than you just achieved. And since both the concept of the game and controls of the game are extremely easy to understand and pick up, it's a perfect game for playing with friends because the game is very easy to get into, and since the rounds last so short, you're going to be handing the control to the next person in no time flat. Moving past the bare basics of the controls, the graphics and the gameplay are also once again extremely polished and really, and I don't use this word lightly, absolutely perfect. Despite your character being a very simple black stick figure, the wonderful animation that he moves with combined with the bright gradient sunset style background makes it feel like you're playing a very artistic scene in a samurai movie. To make your way through each level, you must jump through the hole in the wall on your right hand side by jumping your ninja off of the left or 
right side of the wall until you can angle up the shot and shoot yourself through into the next screen. As I said, it's a wonderful simple premise, although there are a few obstacles in the way in the form of spikes that obviously if you jump into, you're going to die, and moving spikes, which are the exact same concept except they are moving, which of course adds another level of difficulty. There's also three difficulty settings which allows you to toggle on and off lava and also slow down the advancing speed of the death beam. Oh yeah, did I mention that there's a death beam in this game? Well, the concept of that's pretty simple. It's a beam that brings death. If you're playing the game with friends, I suggest you play it on the hardest setting because it's going to end the game quicker and have the control rotating a lot faster. Although as I was playing it by myself for a lot of the time, I found myself playing it on the easiest setting because I just wanted to see how far I would get. The easiest setting removes the lava on the bottom, meaning that if you fall down the bottom of the screen, you simply loop back up to the top of the screen rather than dying, and it also slows down the advancement of the death beam, allowing you to have more time to line up your shots. Which, by the way, becomes increasingly difficult with every color change of the background as the hole in the room that you have to jump through on the right hand side it becomes increasingly smaller. Which I think works as a perfect example of just how tight the controls are in this game. In the later levels, these gaps are only a little bit larger than your character. Although because you're able to make your character jump at the exact moment you want him to, for the exact height you want him to, this challenge is difficult, but it's definitely not impossible. And if you don't make the target, I found that at no point I felt that it was because of the game, but instead due to personal error. And finally, scattered throughout these rooms are the letters N-I-N-J-A, spelling out ninja, which you are if you're playing this game, and if you manage to collect enough of them, it will give you this extremely cool graphic and have your character fly through several rooms at once. It's probably the coolest effect I've seen in any Atari 2600 game so far, and yes, that includes the Death Star blowing up in Star Wars Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle. So, major thumbs up for that, it's so awesome that the first time it happened to me, I actually died immediately afterwards because I was so distracted by how cool it looked. It was really just the awesome cherry on an already very well decorated cake, which also just so happens to be a ninja. There's really just no part of this game that I can fault. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I highly recommend it. And so if you're looking for an extremely enjoyable, highly addictive game to play with polished controls and perfect graphics, then I highly suggest you ninja sneak your way down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Wall Jump Ninja for the Atari 2600. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Now I'm off to play some more Wall Jump Ninja. Hello and welcome to Grin Reviews. I'm Grin Grimsley coming to you live as a pre-recorded audio dub over footage I shot yesterday at the famous Loch Ness. Why did I choose to dub the audio? Well, because recording outside gives you dodgy audio at the best of times, and the guy driving the boat wouldn't stop giving me facts about the lock long enough for me to do this introduction. Did you know that Loch Ness is part of the Great Glen of Scotland? Well, it is. Loch Ness is part of the Great Glen of Scotland. But perhaps more importantly than that piece of geographical trivia is the question of why I'm here. And that can be answered twofold. Well, firstly because apparently management, while considering a request for a new lighting stand to replace our old worn out one to be exorbitant, considered sending me from Australia to Scotland to review a video game as absolutely necessary. And secondly because the game we're having a look at today features the star of Loch Ness herself, good old Nessie. And that game is of course none other than Shark Attack for the Atari 2600. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, there are no sharks in Loch Ness, which I've gotta say is a pretty naive statement to make. After all, people have been searching Loch Ness for Nessie for several hundred, possibly thousand years. I'm not taking the time to research this because this is a game review and the fact that I'm already in Scotland for it is already ludicrous enough. But the fact of the matter is that sharks are considerably smaller than Nessie, and so therefore, if Nessie is real, which she of course is and has been evading our careful search for her, then chances are sharks being considerably smaller than Nessie would do an even better job of that. 
However, something I'm far less willing to defend is the graphics in this game. After all, what we've just established is what they're trying to depict here on the screen right now is beyond any doubt supposed to be Loch Ness. Otherwise, why would the game feature the Loch Ness Monster or Loch Sharks? Which is of course a problem, because if this is indeed supposed to be a depiction of Loch Ness, which it certainly is, then it is quite possibly the worst depiction of Loch Ness that I've ever seen. You can see on the top of the game screen is an expanse of water, which at least they got that right, a small boat of some kind, and a tropical island with palm trees on it? I'm not really sure what they were trying to go for with that, but in comparison here's actual footage of a real life small boat of some kind moving across the actual Loch Ness, and as you can see it looks pretty much as different as it possibly could. Jumping back to the footage of the game, it becomes immediately obvious that they got the foliage wrong, they got the sand wrong, and really the overall look is just way off. In reality, this looks more like the ocean with a small tropical island, and the game's depiction of Loch Ness more closely resembles the opening to SpongeBob SquarePants than it does to practically anywhere in Scotland. And so with my objection to the graphics cleared up, I know what some of you are probably thinking at the moment. Grin, this is currently 3 minutes into a game review, and you've pretty much not mentioned the game at all. And I do apologize for that, so let's get straight into it. Shark Attack for the Atari 2600 is a bad game, and it's really not worth playing at all, it's total garbage. Gameplay wise it borrows poorly from Pac-Man and Berserk, while also expertly adopting the worst part of Tapeworm. Giving you the end result that you would rather be playing any one of those three other games, including Tapeworm, which I didn't even give the most favorable review to. So first up, what it borrows from Pac-Man? Well, as you can probably tell by looking at the screen, Shark Attack, much like Mousetrap and Pac-Man, is a game in which you navigate through a maze setting. This on the surface is completely fine, and as I believe I've said before, Pac-Man doesn't own mazes, Theseus was doing it first. The problem arises, however, with execution. You see, with Mousetrap and Pac-Man, the main challenge of the maze is to not simply navigate your way through it, but to do so while avoiding your enemies, who too are also navigating through the maze. In those two games, you have to be constantly aware of your surroundings, trying to avoid getting yourself cornered by your enemies while also collecting all of the collectibles. However, in Shark Attack, the maze is entirely pointless, and navigating it is the worst thing ever. The controls in this game are absolutely miserable, and the amount of times that I wasn't able to go in a direction because I just couldn't fit, or I got stuck on the seaweed, was just utterly exhausting. The controls in this game are so bad that the game is just so unenjoyable to play, because half the time it feels like you're fighting the game itself to just be able to move. And as I said, the maze itself is a pointless addition to the game, because really, removing it wouldn't change the gameplay at all, aside from making it so that you don't get constantly stuck due to terrible hit detection. I say this because it's not a complex maze to navigate, or at least it wouldn't be if it wasn't for the terrible controls, and so it's not adding any difficulty due to that. And also unlike Pac-Man, the twists and turns of the maze are not important to keep track of while trying to avoid enemies, because the enemies themselves don't subscribe to the maze's layout and just swim straight over top of it. Speaking of the enemies, which are the two elements that were borrowed from Tapeworm and Berserk, they are also just garbage. The main enemy in the game, the sharks, just like the bad guys from Tapeworm, swim directly across the screen from side to side, there's no indication of when they're going to come, there's no pattern to when they come, and there's pretty much no avoiding them if you're close to the side of the screen. And it's not even a risk and reward sort of thing going on, because you have to go to the side of the screen in order to collect all of the pearls, as until you do so, the game doesn't spawn any more of them, so therefore, death is completely at random and completely completely unavoidable, meaning that there's pretty much zero talent involved in playing this game and really no incentive to try to beat your high score because it's simply not skill based. And the second enemy, Nessie, who is done relatively well and behaves quite similar to the giant bouncing smiley face from Berserk, 
is kind of unnecessary because unlike Berserk, it doesn't appear when you've spent too much time on one screen, but instead just at complete random. And as there is only one screen, and as Nessie is pretty easily avoidable since you just need to go into one of the corners and wait for her to get bored and leave, unfortunately, the great beast of Loch Ness is kind of also entirely pointless in this entirely pointless game. And so I suppose what I'm trying to say is unless you want to waste your time with terrible gameplay, awful controls, graphics that don't make sense, and pointless enemies, then head down to your local video store and pick up something that's not Shark Attack for the Atari 2600. So if you guys are still struggling to understand me, there is something that can help you. Behind the bar, and it's called whiskey. It's amazing. You drink this, you'll definitely understand me. It translates every language in the world. It will even improve your chances of seeing something strange on the wall. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Grin Reviews. Well, these days it seems that no one's able to make standalone pieces of media anymore, because after they do, everyone who's enjoyed it is always waiting around for the subsequent inevitable sequel. And so in light of that, the game we're having a look at today is none other than River Raid 2 for the Atari 2600. Now, firstly, before I get too far into it, I do want to say that I am slightly disappointed by the name of this game. You see on the front of the cartridge and on the front of the VHS-style clamshell box, it's simply called River Raid 2, which is, while at the very least a descriptive title for the sequel of River Raid 1, not exactly hugely exciting. However, on the back of the box, the game's subtitle is revealed and... It is far less exciting than simply calling the game River Raid 2, as the game's full title appears to be River Raid 2 The Ultimate Flying Battle, which is not a great name. You see, ultimately, a sequel film's title should sound cooler than its predecessor, for instance, The Empire Strikes Back, and ideally, it should have a pun in its title that makes reference to subject matter in the previous film or the name of the previous film itself. For instance, Die Hard's 2 genius subtitle of Die Harder. Whereas, unfortunately, River Raid 2's subtitle of The Ultimate Flying Battle is not only difficult to prove factually, but is also just really incredibly bland sounding. For instance, River Raid 2 could have been subtitled something cool and referential like Streams of Destiny, Salmon Squadron against the current upstream up evil, Hard Banks against the Floon, or River Raid 2 raiding rivers and other fun summertime activities. However, unfortunately, they chose to not go for any of these titles, but instead stick with what they had. And so, let's get down to having a look at River Raid 2, the ultimate flying battle. However, in doing so, we simply cannot avoid looking back at River Raid 1, both because as a sequel, River Raid 2 will be inevitably compared to its predecessor, and also the mere fact that this game is claiming to be the ultimate flying battle means that necessity dictates it has to be compared against what I believe to be the previous best flight game on the Atari 2600, which is, of course, River Raid 1. Essentially, River Raid 2 has laid down the gauntlet by claiming to be the ultimate flying battle, and we therefore must look at both River Raid 1 and River Raid 2 to decide exactly which game deserves the title. It's the ultimate battle for the ultimate title of Ultimate Flying Battle. So if we're going to compare them, we might as well compare them. So let's chuck them up on the screen side by side and start nitpicking. And, of course, at least for the viewer at least who is currently not playing the game, the first thing that probably jumps out at you is the graphics, and so that's as good a place as any to begin with. And, as you can likely tell, between the two of them, the graphics are relatively similar. River Raid 2's is slightly more ambitious, however, that is perhaps to its detriment. As while there is a lot more going on, sometimes what exactly is going on can be a little bit difficult to tell. For instance, while some things in River Raid 2, like taking off from the aircraft carrier at the beginning of each level, is amazingly awesome and really blows everything from River Raid 1 out of the water, However, contrarily, I have no idea what these are or what this is, and as far as gameplay goes, there is a graphical-related problem that I'll get to in a minute. And so I suppose when it comes down to graphics between River Raid 1 and River Raid 2 in the competition for the title of the Ultimate Flying Battle, it's... 
a bit of a wash. Honestly, I think that I do prefer River Raid 1's graphics because they're somewhat more simplistic and it's a lot easier to tell what's going on. I guess less busy is probably the word that I'm looking for. However, that said, while less perfected, River Raid 2's graphics is more ambitious. And I find it difficult faulting the game for its ambition, especially when it results in cool things like this. And I think that's probably a good point to stop talking about graphics, or at least stop talking about graphics exclusively, as while I do have more to say, what I do have to say ties into gameplay. Which means, speaking of gameplay, a fundamental difference between the two games is that River Raid 2 sort of has a level system going on. In that every now and then, you're required to land your plane on and subsequently take your plane off from an aircraft carrier. Why this is important to mention is that in doing this, River Raid 2 entirely changes the way the game feels from River Raid 1 as it affects the entire pacing of the game. You see, in River Raid 1, once you began the game, it was a non-stop battle with no pauses and no slow moments. It was a non-stop battle of reflexes and stamina as you continuously move faster through the game. And the only respite you were ever given in River Raid 1 was death as the game was nice enough to let you start again on your own time whenever you lost a life, but still if you ever did need a break to collect yourself, you did need to lose a life first. This fast paced and entirely relentless gameplay from River Raid 1 is what made the game for me at least entirely addictive and one of my favorite games I've ever played so far. However, sliding on over to look at River Raid 2, that pacing is entirely broken up because at the end of each stage, the gameplay style changes. You have to land your plane on an aircraft carrier and once landed, you can choose when you want to take off again. Due to this, at no point while playing River Raid 2 did I feel the same rush of adrenaline as I did while playing River Raid 1. However, that said, there is far more to do in River Raid 2 and the controls are far more difficult and fuel in the game seems far fewer in between. As such, while River Raid 2 is definitely not as addictive and when you lose the game, you don't immediately want to reset and try to beat your high score, it is a far more tactical game and it definitely makes you think more than River Raid 1 rather than simply relying entirely on your reflexes. It's definitely an entirely different kind of game, which is sort of funny for a sequel, but it's no less fun. It's just a different kind of fun. However, the earlier mentioned graphical problem with the game that ties into the gameplay is unfortunately to do with the more complex and perhaps overly ambitious controls. You see, in River Raid 1, in order to speed up, you push forward on your pleasure stick, and in order to slow down, you simply pull backwards on it. Now in River Raid 2, it's a very similar thing, but with one significant difference. You see, while pushing forward on your pleasure stick does make you speed up, it also makes you drop altitude. And while pulling back, as you might well expect, causes you to slow down, but also forces you to climb. Now this 3D element to the game is pretty darn awesome, although it has a slight problem graphically, as there's no difference as far as the graphical representation of your plane goes, whether you're close to the ground or high in the air. Sure, you'll be moving at a different speed, but there is that point in the crossover in which you go from being able to fly over a riverbank or you're just going to slam directly into it. And when it comes to less obvious things, for instance, the aircraft carriers of the enemies, it can be pretty darn difficult to tell if you're high enough. And maneuverability wise, it also limits your actions, as you can't simply speed up to avoid an object, because in doing so, you have to also remember that you're dropping altitude, and in some situations, this can be fatal. You do have an indicator of your altitude on the bottom of the screen, but you're not really ever looking at that, because you're too busy staring at your plane, trying to make sure you don't run into things or get shot. I think this game could have definitely benefited from your plane scaling depending on if you're high or low, or even just changing color, or any kind of indication as to how close the ground is. Even just a shadow beneath you would have made it a lot more intuitive. It also causes some problems when it comes to shooting your enemies, as unlike in the previous game in which your regular bullet could hit a plane, boat, or bridge, in this game there's two different shots, one for airborne enemies and the others lower to the ground. Now, this is a cool addition, however, it is unfortunately pretty poorly executed. You see, in order to launch your ground-based attack, you must pull back on your pleasure stick and hit the red button. 
which is of course a problem because pulling back on your pleasure stick changes your altitude. As I've just established in this game, altitude is something you have to keep track of pretty carefully. Having to change your altitude in order to fire one of your two shots is, I think, pretty darn stupid. It would have, I believe, been a far better alternative if to shoot your regular bullet that takes down planes, you simply press the red button and in order to launch the bomb which hits the lower altitude objects, you hold the red button. That would have been, I feel, at least a better alternative than having to alter your altitude. However, that said, while somewhat clunkily introduced, these new gameplay elements add a lot of tactics and a lot of fun to the game. For instance, as far as I can tell, while you're in the river raiding section of the level, there is no fuel. So the way I personally usually play this game is that while in the river section, I drop my altitude significantly and just try to get in and out as quickly as I can before I run out of fuel and crash. However, when I'm flying over the open ocean section, that's when I pull my altitude up, slow down to a crawl, make sure I fuel up whenever I can, and try to rack up as many points possible. These additions to the game are great fun and add a lot of diversity. However, it does make the game feel nothing like River Raid 1. Although what it does feel like is River Raid 2, and that's okay. And I think that's where I'm going to bring this competition for who gets the title of the ultimate flying battle to the end. River Raid 2 is undeniably, both graphically and gameplay wise, a more ambitious game than that of River Raid 1. However, alternatively, on the flip side, River Raid 1, due to its limited and more conservative scope, is a far more polished game. And so as far as which one is truly the ultimate flying battle, while I think I do personally prefer River Raid 1, River Raid 2 is still undeniably excellent within its own right. And so I'm going to controversially call this a drawer and say that if you are looking to have the ultimate flying battle experience, then head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of River Raid 1 and River Raid 2 for the Atari 2600. Welcome to Grin Reviews. The video game we're having a look at today was likely named in direct response to the nasty rumors began by Futurama that the sport of boxing was fixed. Man, I thought ultimate robot fighting was real, but it turns out it's fixed, like boxing. In your left corner, it's real sports boxing for the Atari 2600. What does bowling, miniature golf, fishing, basketball, pinball, soccer, and firing yourself out of a cannon have in common with boxing? Well, they are all eight of them, things you can quite easily do in real life, but now can do from the comfort of your own home, on the Atari 2600. However, unlike the other games named, while boxing is something that anyone can really do, it's something that most people would choose not to do because it can be rather painful and rather dangerous. And so playing it on the Atari 2600 just might be the better option because it means you're less likely to get your jaw broken by Danny Green. And I would really say that's probably a major advantage to real sports boxing because while I would probably prefer to just play miniature golf in real life, I definitely don't want to get my jaw broken, so I would probably, given the choice between the two, go for the virtual reality version of the sport rather than the real one. Although that said, saying that I would rather play a game than have my jaw broken is probably not the highest praise a game has ever received, and so it's probably time to get talking about the game a bit more specifically. As you can tell from the cover art of the game's cartridge, this game contains boxing, 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 and boxing, which, if you're a boxing fan, might interest you. However, I hasten to mention before we get too far into this review that I don't really follow boxing too closely and so the nuances of the rules in this game will probably go past me a little bit. And with that said, this is Real Sports Boxing on the Atari 2600 and I'm sure the first thing you've noticed is compared to miniature golf, the graphics in this game are nothing short of outstanding. Not only can you tell your character and your opponent's character apart very easily, but you can also select your character and your opponent's character from a list of four of them and not only are they all noticeably visually different, but even it would seem as far as I can tell from playing it even controls slightly differently. 
It's certainly a far cry from the coloured square graphical depictions of golfers in miniature golf for the Atari 2600 as these people you play as clearly look like they are indeed people. And on top of that, much like basketball for the Atari 2600, you're playing in a 3D environment, although unlike in basketball, the 3D environment is a lot more easy to interact with and the game doesn't seem to get confused about exactly where in the 3D axis you're standing. And on top of that, other cool little graphical additions like the fact there's a little bell that rings at the start of each round and that your fight is being viewed by a mystery science theater style audience adds that little bit extra to the game. Although that said, unfortunately, despite all of these commendable aspects of the game that I mentioned, I would rather spend my time playing any of the other 7 sports games I've listed than much more of real sports boxing. This game just doesn't really do it for me. I found that the pacing of the game was really surprisingly slow, and that no matter how much I tried to get into the game, I just didn't really find that at any point I was very invested in it. One of the annoying things is that depending on what kind of punch you want to throw depends on entirely which way you're pointing your pleasure stick when you hit the red button. Which means that if you want to throw several different kinds of punches in a row, you're going to be having to constantly change direction and it just doesn't seem natural. The controls in the game are definitely not intuitive and I found that I ended up just settling for spamming the regular punch and regular block and ended up winning the game anyway, so I guess that works fine I suppose, but it definitely didn't feel rewarding. On top of that, unless you manage to get knocked out, or if you manage to knock someone out, which I, by the way, never did, the game just goes for too darn long. Or at least, it feels like it goes too darn long, but in reality, when looking back at the recording, goes for less time than I thought it did. You see, each round of the game has a countdown timer on the bottom of the screen from the 3 minute mark, although in reality, those 3 minutes only last 57 seconds. I really have no idea why they went and did this, uh, Google tells me that a boxing round used to or possibly does last 3 minutes, so I suppose they were trying to be accurate to that, but if you're going to have a timer in a game, it should actually line up with the time it's saying it represents. It's weird and strangely reality distorting to see a countdown timer from 3 minutes only go for 1 minute, and I really think they should have either made the rounds last the 3 minutes they're claiming to, or a better idea than that would be just to have the timer go from 1 minute even if it's inaccurate to the real sport. Regardless of what you think they should have done however, from my experience, despite the fact that the rounds were shorter than they were claiming to be, by the time that 3 minutes were up, I was already bored with the game. Unfortunately though, that one round is not the end of the game as it's only one round. After the game quite literally forces you to take a rest as it makes you do nothing for 7 seconds straight, and I've gotta tell you, 7 seconds doesn't sound like much, but when you're forced to stare at a screen and do nothing for 7 seconds, it really does drag on, you're then taken to the next round, which will be the second second not 3 minute round of 7. And at the end of the 7th round, provided the game's not being ended earlier due to a knockout, whoever's landed the most punches across all 7 rounds will be given victory. And that's pretty much Real Sports Boxing, a game that ironically I think suffers mainly from the fact that it's a little bit too real. The lightning fast reflexes that real boxers rely on to defend and deliver punches in a boxing match just doesn't translate well to a game that has such sloppy and unintuitive controls. And on top of that, while the graphics in real sports boxing is definitely commendable, the fact that landing a punch in your enemy doesn't really show up as anything at all. I mean, you do see them wince or you do see the head move back, but since the characters are so small on the screen, it could have definitely benefited from being a little bit more cartoony. As it stands in the heat of the moment, it's sometimes difficult to tell if you've even landed a punch, and even when you do land a punch, half the time the reaction is barely anything, and it's not exactly satisfying. However, with all of that said and done, as I stated at the beginning, I'm not the biggest boxing fan, and so maybe for you, this hyper-realism is actually a draw card. I could certainly understand that if you're a really big fan of boxing, these tiny elements that I found to be nothing more than tedious could be instead seen as intricate, carefully crafted details that excite you. And the idea of it being cartoony and over the top seems ludicrous to you, especially in a game titled Real Sports Boxing. And if that is the stance you have, I fully understand it. And I suppose with this review coming to an end, I've gotta say, 
If you're like me and you're not huge on boxing, this is probably not the game you're looking for. There are better, more exciting games, and that's even within the genre of sports games. Although if you're a really big fan of boxing and what you've seen on the screen is something that interests you, then disregard what I've been saying as you're coming from a different place than I am. And from that place, I suggest you head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Real Sports Boxing for the Atari 2600. Hello and welcome to Grid Reviews. If years of watching movies has taught me anything, it's that every hero needs a Katamasis. Whether it be the Minds of Warrior and your Frodo Baggins, or it be the Chamber of Secrets and your Harry Potter, or even if it's the Death Star and your Luke Skywalker, or if it's Dark Chambers, and you're on the Atari 2600. Dark Chambers is one of the most impressive and amazing video game experiences I've ever undertaken. For about three minutes, and then unfortunately it becomes one of the most monotonous experiences I've ever undergone, video game or otherwise. You see, not unlike sitting in the waiting room awaiting an invasive doctor's checkup and quickly realizing that the three magazines sitting on the table in front of you, while initially seeming vaguely entertaining on a closer inspection, reveal themselves to have little enough content to warrant a pamphlet, let alone three magazines, and in the long run fail to do anything of note to stave off the ever-encroaching boredom. Yes, indeed, Dark Chambers is unfortunately the worst kind of bad game. It is, as I've just stated, a boring game, and my gosh is it boring. I suppose out of all the games I've played so far, it is most similar to Berserk and Halo 2600. However, unfortunately, unlike Berserk, Dark Chambers is extremely, excruciatingly slow-paced. And furthermore, unfortunately, unlike Halo 2600, Dark Chambers has no real sense of progression and no satisfying ending. The game pits you, an Indiana Jones-style character who has let himself go a little bit, against an array of alphabetically ordered chambers which, as you might well have guessed from the title of the game, are relatively darkened. Much like Berserk and Halo, you can shoot a weapon in various directions, and quite similar to Halo, you can find a couple of upgrades to your weapon, a shield, and keys in order to unlock doors. Which might leave you wondering what is the exact issue with the game, because so far it sounds pretty darn good. Well, you see, the problem is that when it comes to difficulty curve, there is none. Unlike Berserk, which has its enemies becoming faster shooting and moving with every new room you move into, in Dark Chambers, they really do not change at all from the first screen you're on, regardless of how many more rooms you go into or how many further chambers you descend to. Occasionally a new enemy is introduced, but that new enemy is just the exact same as the old enemy with a new skin layered on top of one of the previous ones. Essentially, it means they take one more shot to kill, but are no more difficult to do so aside from having that little bit extra piece of health. Speaking of which, I cannot help but think that the layered system of the enemies is just utterly bizarre. Rather than there just being five different enemies in the game, the Grim Reaper, the Wizard, the Ghost, the Skeleton, and the Zombie, there's basically just one enemy that gets Russian doled on top of each other. You shoot the Reaper, it becomes the Wizard, you shoot the Wizard, it becomes a Ghost, the Ghost becomes the Skeleton, and the Skeleton becomes the Zombie. Not only is this a really strange way of doing the bad guys in the game, but also the order really doesn't make much sense. I just don't understand how a ghost can die and become a skeleton, and a skeleton die and become a zombie. You would think if anything the order should go wizard, zombie, skeleton, ghost, because I just can't imagine how killing a ghost could produce a skeleton, and then killing a skeleton would produce a zombie. I'm not sure where the skeleton is hiding within the ghost, and I'm really not sure where the zombie is hiding within the skeleton. You should surely be able to see the flesh of the zombie poking out through the skeleton, and I'm just saying from a conservation of mass perspective, this Russian doll enemy setup really doesn't make much sense. Further, as I mentioned earlier, they don't become more difficult to kill as the game goes, which becomes even more of an issue because not only are you getting better at killing them, but you do, as I mentioned, also find upgrades, which means that the already not difficult to kill bad guys become even less difficult to kill. In fact, at no point when playing this game have I ever died due to the enemies. No, in fact, instead, I've died due to a much more annoying issue with this game. You see, this game has death blocks and poison, where if you mistakenly pick up the poison rather than the health, you lose some of your health, and if you accidentally step on a death block, you'll also take damage. 
Now on the surface, this mechanic might sound like a fine addition because it's just going to make you pay attention to what you're doing and play the game a little bit more carefully. However, there is a major issue with the death blocks and poison in the way, or more accurately, in the places that they spawn. You see the death blocks and poison appear more often than not when you kill an enemy spawn point. And the problem with this is that each alphabetically ordered chamber in the game is set out like a maze. Quite simply, you enter the chamber, you have to find the door, and more often than not, to get to the door or to even make the door appear, you have to kill spawn points you find across the length of the maze. Now, the problem with this is that sometimes these spawn points appear in areas of the maze that you must simply pass through in order to continue with the game. Which becomes a serious issue if, when killing the spawn point, it drops a death block. It's not an uncommon occurrence when playing this game that you'll just have to take the hit if you want to continue playing. Which becomes an especially dangerous thing later on in the game where potions are far less common and if you are forced to take a hit several times in a row, you're going to find that you've reached a completely unavoidable and extraordinarily anticlimactic game over. You'll be staring down a death block with the knowledge that you've got no health and there's no more health available in the game and you've got no other option than to just throw yourself into the death block and call it a day. At one point this happened to me, one hour and three minutes into the game, all the way down in chamber W. It was extremely disappointing to be so close to letter Z after being bored with the gameplay for over 45 minutes and realized that the game had positioned me into a situation where there was no way I could continue. However, after spending an hour watching A to W go past on the screen, my interests were peaked and I just had to know what awaited me beyond door Z. And so I went back into the game, spent another hour and seven minutes playing through it, got all the way to the end of chamber Z, and it just took me right back to chamber D. I don't really understand that. If anything, if not a victory screen, I expected it to take me back to chamber A, but make it more difficult. But no, an hour and eight minutes in, Z goes to D, and the game just goes on. So I suppose what I'm saying is that in death, the game is extremely anticlimactic and disappointing. And in victory, the game is extremely anticlimactic and disappointing. And so in closing, Dark Chambers is a slow-paced, extraordinarily boring game with absolutely no payoff. And so since life is too short to play boring video games, I highly suggest you head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of a better game, maybe Space Invaders or Missile Command, for the Atari 2600. Hello and welcome to Grid Reviews. I'm having some trouble restraining the excitement I feel towards the game we're playing today. And that excitement might just break out for the Atari 2600. You, you see, it was a pun. Breakout for the Atari 2600 is a game that is rather fortunately not about a disappointing increase in facial pimples. No, indeed, it seems the game's title is instead referring to breaking blocks through bouncing a ball outwards. And also, no doubt the title has something to do with prison, as breakout is what you do from confinement. And even if you don't succeed in breaking out of prison, you'll likely still find yourself breaking blocks, often in the hot sun, if you've fought the lore and the lore won. So I suppose what I'm saying is that despite not knowing the intricacies of the story of this game, as management has once again failed to send me the manual, I still remain fairly confident that the game is at least partially about breaking blocks. And so with the story of the game covered, or at the very least as covered as I can possibly do it with the information provided to me, let's get talking about the gameplay. The first thing that I notice when starting the game is that it reminds me to at least some degree of Space Invaders, or as we've come to know it, that scene from Guardians of the Galaxy, the game. Although in reality, having now played the game, I now see that they could not be more dissimilar. Well, they in fact could be, but what I'm trying to say is that they are very different. You see, unlike in Space Invaders, the blocks above you do not move towards you, but instead hold their position. And while you are similar to Space Invaders controlling that little thing on the bottom of the screen with the objective of destroying all of the things on the top of the screen, you do so in completely different ways. You see, in this game, neither you nor your opponents, or 
inanimate objects that you have to destroy can actually fire and instead the only projectile in the entire game is that one bouncing around the screen. The bottom of the screen underneath your character is essentially the goals and if a bouncing projectile manages to get past you and goes into the bottom of the screen you'll lose a life. However, if you manage to connect with the projectile, it'll bounce back up towards the top of the screen and if it hits a block, it will destroy said block, giving you a point. And while destroying these blocks reminded me of an aspect of the Star Wars game Jedi Arena, the actual bouncing of a projectile as your only weapon is, as far as I'm aware, in relation to the games I've played so far, unique to this here game. It might on the surface look relatively easy, but I actually found it rather difficult and never got any good at aiming so to speak. It's not that difficult or it's at least doable most of the time to return a serve if I'm to use tennis terms here, but actually managing to hit the projectile in a way that bounces it in the direction that you want can be quite difficult. To begin with this is not a problem as there's so many blocks on the screen that simply returning a shot will likely hit one of them. Although as the game continues and you destroy more and more blocks, there is obviously less to hit and getting rid of the few remaining ones at the end of a round can be rather difficult. And to compound the issue further, as you can see the blocks on the screen are in colored rows and the further you hit up on the rows increases the speed that the projectile is moving. Returning the serve is not a difficulty if you've only so far hit the bottom row of blocks. But if you hit one of the blocks on the top, not only does the projectile speed up immensely, but also your paddle will shrink, making it even more difficult to return. This is obviously something that causes a great difficulty, as if you're hitting the ones at the top, there is also likely not that many blocks remaining, and so you're also not only trying to return the fast moving projectile with a comparatively smaller paddle, but you're also trying to aim the bounce of the projectile into one of the few remaining slabs. Now, just just to be clear, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, all I'm saying is that I am personally bad at the game. I love being bad at the game, the game is a great challenge and I look forward to eventually, hopefully, getting better at it. But in the meantime, I'm enjoying the challenge of the game not in spite of the difficulty but entirely due to it. And you may have noticed that I mentioned that you control a paddle and indeed, this is one of the few games I've played so far that actually utilizes the paddle controller. Which is probably suiting because the paddle controllers have pictures of tennis rackets on them and this game is basically a tennis match against a breakable wall. The game also has a 2 player option which I'm actually playing here with me controlling the second player mainly because for some reason in this game player 1's paddle wasn't working too well. It was super sensitive and just kept jumping around which is not exactly what you want when you're trying to return a serve. However, I'm fairly certain that that is a problem with the controller itself rather than the game and I think I'm probably just having hardware issues. As well as the standard take turns 2 player version of the game that most games on the Atari 2600 I've seen so far have and is what I've been playing for the majority of this here video. There does also appear to be a game variant in which you have both player 1 and player 2 paddles on the screen at the same time. However, unfortunately for me, I could never seem to get it to work, as instead with each life lost, the game alternated which of the player paddles could be moved. And on top of that, the paddle that could be moved was restricted to its side of the screen. So, as you might well imagine, these rounds did not last a very long time, as it only took until the projectile was heading to a side of the screen I could not get to. And on top of the multiplayer variants of the game, there's also the alternative version of the game Breakthrough in which the projectile goes straight through blocks and only bounces off of the walls. This version of the game is obviously similar but I found to be not quite as fun. However, it is definitely more musical. But I digress so let's stop talking about the various variants and move on back to talking about the main version of the game which when you're using a controller that's not broken, the controls in this game are fantastic and actually had me wondering what it would be like to play Space Invaders if it was using the paddle controller rather than the pleasure stick. 
It's just one of those games that whenever you lose, it doesn't feel like it's because the game wronged you, but because you could just probably do with being a little bit better at it. And due to this, the game is extremely addictive. Every time I got game over, I found myself immediately resetting the game, going back into it, and trying to beat my high score. So if you're looking for a fun, addictive, colorful game with tight controls to play on the Atari 2600 this Friday night, I highly suggest you head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Breakout for the Atari 2600. What do you mean they moved the time slot of this show to a Monday? When did that happen? Hello, I'm Grin Ribsley and welcome to Grin Reviews. You know, there's some days where you feel like doing nothing other than heading down to the local speedway and taking a spin in your own personal Formula One car. But for those of us who just don't have time to get to the track, there's Pole Position for the Atari 2600. Pole Position may very well be the most 80s cartoon to come out of the 80s. In fact, it may well even not be going too far to insinuate that in the competition for most 80s cartoon to come out of the 80s, Pole Position may very well hold Pole Position. The show is about a group of recently orphaned children who are operating a crime-fighting team called Pole Position out of a stunt driving show, which, along with the crime-fighting team, was previously ran by their parents. They have a lovable pet companion, and their cars are full of gadgets and can even talk to them. Which, I mean, this show came out in 1984, only two years after Knight Rider began, so it's pretty clear where they drew their inspiration from. The show is essentially Knight Rider for kids with less David Hasselhoff. However, unfortunately, it has not aged well and is definitely a difficult show to go back and watch. The stories are just not that great, the pacing is very painfully slow, and the voice acting can be sometimes grating. In fact, the only thing about the show that still holds up today is the wicked 80s theme song with shredding hair metal vocals. And so since the show has dated so poorly, it should probably not surprise anyone that when it came to making a video game adaptation of the show, they chose to incorporate in the game very few of the show's story elements. However, despite Pole Position the game differing greatly from the cartoon of which it shares a name, the game is still easily the best racing game I've ever played, one of the best games in general I've ever played, and almost indisputably the best looking game I've ever seen. And so on that subject, since it's probably the first thing you immediately notice when turning on the game, let's get talking about the graphics, which are nothing short of breathtaking. If you were to compare it with the only other racing game I've ever played, the difference is day and night. L literally, because the other game is Night Driver. However, moving past that pun, when I was reviewing Night Driver for the Atari 2600, I lamented that the graphics in some areas, especially regarding the car you drive, look so poorly done, especially considering that other objects in the game, such as your opponent's vehicles and random background objects, look so comparatively excellent. And while I did in fact lord the lights coming towards you as a method to represent where the road was, and did an excellent job of adding a sense of speed, they really weren't much to look at. At. However, if we move on over to look at pole position, well, the graphics are just completely staggering. The car you're driving is very clearly a Formula One, and it very much looks like one with no imagination needed. This is where I would put up footage of a Formula One car racing in real life as evidence, but unfortunately the copyright owners for Formula One are particularly aggressive, so I'm not going to show that. But what I will show is the artwork from the front of the cartridge, which looks like the car you're driving, so good job on that. Unfortunately, the car behind you in the picture on the cartridge looks absolutely nothing like your opponent's cars in the game. Though I'm not really complaining about that, if you're going to skimp on graphics anywhere, which is pretty much a necessity on the Atari 2600 due to limitations, I'd rather you do so on the opponent's vehicles that pass you quickly, rather than the car you're driving and so staring at the back of for the entire game. To do the opposite would make absolutely no sense and would be complete lunacy. Looking at 
at you, Night Driver. Though it's so very obvious that it could probably go without being said, but the cars in the game are not the only graphical thing worth mentioning. As indeed there's also the track, the foreground, and even a surprisingly detailed background. However, mere graphics alone don't really mean much, and if this were just a pretty picture, while it would still be pretty, a good game it would make not. Though fortunately this is not the case when it comes to pole position, as every single piece of graphics in the game is not only extremely impressive, but also adds another level of functionality and realism to the game. What I mean by this is that the graphics don't just serve to make the game look good, but they also give you visual information about what's going on. For instance, to hark back to Night Driver, I complain that there is no animation for the car you're driving to show that it's turning left or right, and due to this combined with the stark background of the game, it was sometimes difficult to tell just how sharply you were turning, or even if you were turning at all. It became really easy to understeer, or indeed oversteer. However, in pole position, not only have they given us a turning animation, which is even more impressive than the banking animation from River Raid, but also even given us a moving background that helps feel like we're actually moving around a track rather than just endlessly moving randomly through a dark void. And yes, indeed, I did say track. Unlike Night Driver's seemingly completely random stretch of road that endlessly stretches in front of you, pole position has an actual track layout, and if you pay close enough attention to what you're doing, you would notice that you're actually doing circuits of the course. Now, to be completely honest, I, in reality, never paid close attention to this. I was too busy making sure to avoid other drivers and making sure to stay off of the walls. And, as it turns out, you really don't need to know where you are on the track to do a pretty okay job. However, that said, I cannot help but praise the extra level of detail and realism they put into the map, and even if I wasn't paying close attention to it, on a subconscious level, I'm sure it adds the overall enjoyment of the game, and almost certainly your improvement of the game, because instead of just endlessly driving on a randomly generated course appearing in front of you, you're actually going around the same track and doing laps of it, so even if you don't know you're doing it, you're probably subconsciously getting better at what you're doing. Though, let's now move past the graphics and start talking about the gameplay, which, much like the graphics, are expertly crafted. Did. And since we have been comparing elements of this game to Night Driver, I feel the first thing we need to mention when talking about gameplay is the controls, or more accurately, the controller. You see, to play Night Driver, you utilize a paddle controller, which I thought was extremely cool and fitting, as turning the dial was at least somewhat like turning a steering wheel, adding an extra level of realism. Though over on pole position, I was at first a little bit disappointed that it had reverted back to utilizing the pleasure stick. However, as you may well have just noticed, I said at first, and indeed, my opinion rather quickly changed on this control choice. You see, while it is slightly disappointing that to turn left you push your pleasure stick left, and to turn right you push your pleasure stick right, which is definitely not as immersive as it would be to use the dial on the paddle controller, the game more than makes up for this with the fact that you can actually change your gears by pushing forward and pulling backwards on your pleasure stick. The game, much like driving a real Formula 1 car gives you the option of switching between two gears, high and low, which adds an entire another dimension to the gameplay. You're no longer just trying to make sure your car is moving fast and not running into anything, but you're also making sure to be in the high gear when you're moving fast and low gear while trying to get up to speed. On top of this, I really appreciate that the red button is not the accelerator, but instead the brake, and your vehicle is just always accelerating. Because of this, I never use the red button, because why wouldn't I want to be speeding up? And it's just neat that the game developers realize that if you're playing a racing game, you of course want to go fast, and rather than forcing you to constantly hold down the red button, they just instead do the job for you. It's a really simple innovation, but it didn't go unnoticed, and it certainly did not go unnoticed unappreciated. And of course the main point of pole position is to drive fast and rack up a high number on the scoreboard on the top of the screen there, in which you get points for the distance you go within a time limit and you also get points for passing cars. 
The only downside in the entire game is that as the game goes, your opponents become increasingly erratic and basically purposely steer into you. Towards the end of each race, it didn't feel so much like it was a driving simulator, but instead a road rage simulator, as I found myself yelling at the TV screen because of my opponents purposely blocking me, resulting in fiery explosions. Though that aside, I do understand why they did it, as it was basically the only way they could add difficulty later into the game, and it does definitely get your adrenaline spiking as you swerve to avoid your opponents. It's a really fun game to play, and I cannot get over just how much I enjoy this driving. And so whether you're on the curve or a face in adventure in the danger zone, then head down to your local video store and pick up a copy of Pole Position for the Atari 2600. Thanks for watching, and before this video ends, we'd just like to take this opportunity to give a huge thank you and shout out to Bad Art Labs for allowing us to use their completely slaying cover of the Pole Position theme song. The links on the left side of the screen will take you to the original video and allow you to subscribe to their channel, so make sure to send them some love.